Good morning. Good morning. You have to bear with me, I've never done anything like this before. So. Mm. But it's official, you got the logo. Yeah. It's so thick and everything. Go for it. Yeah? Mm. All right. Good morning, um, and thanks for watching. Um, we're here at the uh, at the boat yard at, at West Mystic Wooden Boat, and um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> come on, come on, have a look. So uh, this, if I, I don't know how much um, everyone might have seen of the original construction of all this, but um, in case anyone's wondering, I had to build this over the boat. Um, this building was not here when I got here. Um, it, I built a lot of it by standing on the old deck um, and all that. So that was that was the beginning of everything else. <laughs> uh, people ask me that a lot. How am I going to get the boat out as well? Me, come on. Come on, me. Come on. Go in, me. Go in. Welcome. Um, it's a tight space. It's very cozy. It's awkward to do a lot of things um, because of how big the boat is relative to the shed. Um, but I managed to sneak a little bit more working space at this end um, so that I would have room for shelves and uh, you know, this sort of thing and a wood stove. Um, which is essential in the winter in New England. Um, um, spot for a 14 inch bandsaw, um, also essential. Um, yeah, so yeah, it, it, it's cozy and it's gone through a number of different uh, iterations. Like when I started out, I had staging at this level all the way around the boat to allow me to do demolition and um, line off the shear again and it helped a lot with the upper part of framing and all that but then when I got into planking it was visually and physically very much in the way so I took all the staging down built these benches um, that are pretty good for uh, for planking and for all sorts of other stuff um, when I don't just fill them with crap you know. <laughs> Um, yeah. Uh, should we head up? We yeah. can head up. And if there's anything um, in the shop or in the shed in the boat that anyone would like to see uh, that we I have not shown, um, just to say so. I'm happy to walk around or whatever. Actually, Andrew, can you show us what's going on right now oh, in yeah. the boat shed? Um, well, what I'm working on right now is decking, um, which um, I've gone with a fairly non-traditional approach, um, but very good, long-lasting, waterproof approach um, with two layers of half inch plywood uh, laminated together and then going to be covered with fiberglass because um, I want to be dry you know this this is not going to be a boat that's going to be undercover most of its life it's going to be out on the water going to be sailing I'd like to be dry um, <laughs> it also um, 
it stiffens the bow up a lot having this omnidirectional strength in you know at this level um it eliminates the need for lodging these um which i did not have so <laughs> um uh yeah. what are you using for other materials so you have half inch um marine plywood over half inch mdo mm -hmm. and um what are you using for um let's say structural epoxy additives and things like that yeah so uh my um inaptitude at this level of logistics notwithstanding um using uh west system slow with a slow hardener uh with 403 microfibers which i keep running out of we use so much doing this so i've been mixing in some colloidal silica and even some high density because i had it as well um, and i think it's fine you know in this application once it's all down it's glued and screwed and it's going to be covered with you know um, a resin matrix so i don't use it as the additive between the two layers it matters a huge amount but and what's the plan for the fiberglass cloth what's that going to be the weight. Uh, I think just a single layer of 10 ounce cloth. Um, that was uh, advice from uh, Harold Burnham of, uh, well, currently getting stuck into Sylvina Beetle restoration, but more known for building Ardell and uh, supervising the Ernestina Morrissey restoration and all kinds of other things. Um, that was his advice, and uh, I imagine that's good enough. <laughs> more than good enough. And then, of course, after that fiberglass is laid, then what's next? What are we expecting to see? Um, stanchions. Yeah, well, actually, that no, stanchions are before the fiberglass. Um, oh. The cut in. I mean, they're before and after. Uh, you have to cut in for them before glassing because I want to make sure that the glass wraps into the, the pockets for all the stanchions um, to protect this as heavily as is possible um, so yeah n right after this layer is finished immediately I'll go to cutting out the pockets for stanchions um, making sure that they all fit which is going to take a little bit of adjustment on the stanchions as well um, I think anyway. um, once they all fit take them out again glass it and then back in again it's like I don't, I don't know how many times I've had to do that with these bloody things now, but um, they're gonna, they're gonna go in and stay in at some point. Honest. For bur bulwarks that are how tall. Uh, I think they finish well. I get to decide. So I think um, it, they vary. The ones that I've seen, um, fifteen inches. Probably with a two inch cap rail, going to be around 20 inches. Do you want to answer a few comments from previous videos? Sure. Um, All right. Thanks for letting us know. Volume is low, says says one viewer. Welcome to my drawing room. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so we, I've. Uh, this is a voice of Anne Bryant. I'm, um, I'm a person. <laughs> I'm not in the videos, but I'm very much of the videos. And I'm going to ask Andrew. I pulled some questions from previous episodes that I thought we should answer live. Um, so. Uh, on episode eight, Richard Nordell commented, I would like to see more work on the boat. I think that he's commenting that um, a lot of times our videos are about something very specific and not necessarily videos of you working. And I just thought you could speak to that. Sure, um, part of that is, is an intentional thing. Um, I think uh, a lot of, of videos, um, channels, blogs, deal with this kind of thing it's covered like you know 
other people are doing that a lot, um, and I don't feel like I have something particular to add in that area. Um, but what I am more interested in is these more unusual and esoteric things that one comes across over the course of doing all this, and like types of problem solving you have to do, types of tool making you have to do, um, types of infrastructure you have to figure out. Like That was a struggle for me not having done a project of this scale by myself, um, figuring out how to do all that, and there isn't a lot of that kind of stuff uh, in the general record I have found. Um, so any way that I can contribute to that, I feel good about. Um, uh, also, uh, very much constrained by uh, physical and time constraints, I'm doing this work um, almost entirely solo. Um, so finding ways to, like, to document what I'm doing is very difficult. Like, I've, I've tried, I've mostly not been able to document a lot of the day-to-day -day stuff um, because I've been doing it. Um, and, uh, but I do very much appreciate um, that you would like to see more. <laughs> That's really nice. <laughs> so, thank you. Um. On episode seven, which was about Dutchman, um, Borg Sven commented, Shouldn't you put the vein of the plugs? That's sort of I I imagine he means grain. Grain, yeah. grain rounds of vein. Uh, shouldn't you put the vein of the plugs perpendicular to the veins of the plank? This way, if the plug expands more than the plank, it will put all of the force lengthwise, not splitting the plank. Yeah, it's that is a very interesting observation, um, which uh, on the face of it you would think would be true. Um, now. First off, to preface this, I've never actually tried that, so it is not first-hand experience of having put the bone 90 degrees to the grain of what you're putting it into, because um, I was always taught to put it parallel with the grain. Um, but my understanding is, is that if you put, if, it's not so much an aesthetic thing of the grain lining up such that it is that the plank or whatever, um, and the bung will expand and contract uniformly together, and that that will not disturb whatever glue you've put in there, um, and will not loosen it. If you put it at 90 degrees, it will swell a bit tighter along the grain of the plank, but it will also correspondingly loosen a bit, so you might end up with gaps, I think. This is my understanding. Again, I haven't actually tried it, but... Um, uh, so you're saying the expansion won't be grain-wise, right? The expansion... Well, the, the wood... Um, uh, I forget all the terminology off the top of my head, but wood um, um, expands and contracts differently in different directions relative to the core of the tree. Um, so I think just in general, as much as possible, you want connected pieces of wood to do that together, um, which is, you know, that's so much of joinery is based on that. That's why dovetails are as good as they are, because the sides of things that are joined with do dovetails, they expand and contract together, and the whole thing stays tight. Um, and it's, yeah, that's my understanding. In episode seven, Edward Johnson commented, what's the black and white flag at the beginning? Oh ah, yes, um, that is the Cross of St. Piran, uh, which is the, the national flag of Cornwall. Um, uh, why, why national flag? Because well, they're a Celtic nation? They're one of the Celtic nations. Yeah. They're not independent from the UK. Um, there are those that live there that wish they were, but um, uh, yeah, it's the, the the flag of Cornwall uh, to commemorate St. Piran, who, as I recall, he, he was sainted because he was, he was Irish, and he sailed across the Irish Sea to convert the Cornish to Christianity on a millstone. So he got flagged. 
And also, your logo has has the American flag in it too. Yes, I was trying to do something that that um, portrayed a bit of both Rosalind's history on both sides, the Atlantic and my own. I'm a dual citizen of the U.S. and U.K. I've lived in both places. Um, culturally, I'm very confusing. I think. Um, <laughs> Notice which way the boat's pointed, right? So, I'm gonna go home one day. <laughs> and uh, in episode four, which was about fasteners, Paul Schoenfelder commented, "Love it! Excellent detail and explanations." Oh, thanks, Paul. <laughs> Would love to see a similar video regarding all the liquid potions used to help preserve a wooden boat. For example, red lead, cuprinol, tar, etc. Yeah, thanks for the input. Um, that is the kind of thing that, again, like I am quite interested in talking about because, like, there's one particularly runs into there's all kinds of stuff available on the market these days, and they don't necessarily make it clear what products play well with each other, what kind of surface preparation they need, um, what things are mutually soluble. Um, all of that data is surprisingly hard to get your hands on so yeah i would do that um, i don't and claim to be the, the world's number one expert by any means but i've, I've done some things yeah <laughs> and this kind of goes back to what we were talking about before with the wealth of knowledge that isn't available so in other words things have strengths but they also have weaknesses right. i think um, a lot of products tell you what they're for but they don't tell you what they're weak at doing because of marketing obviously right, right? so anyway i think I think it's a great idea. And yeah, we'll cook that. We'll cook that up, Paul. No problem. And I've got one more here. It was from way back episode two, which was about planking, where we're steaming planks. Hope everybody's seen that one. It's a good one. And we're going to return to planking soon, so there'll be more on this. But here's a few comments that I thought were interesting that I'd like you to speak to maybe a part of the community. So Vogs commented, have you thought of contacting Acorn to Arabella if you need white oak or just for a visit? Um, and then Raphael Havranek said, thanks to Leo, I discovered your amazing project and I will support you with great pleasure. And then yesterday we had a phone call actually from Bob Emser who's given us a head up that he's about to do. So this is the art of boat building. It's a beautiful channel. Everybody should check it out. And um, Bob called to say that he's about to put in his whiskey plank. So if people haven't s subscribed to that yet, um, The Art of Boat Building is a great channel. But anyway, he wanted us to, yeah, <laughs> he wanted us I'm not, to. I'm a little ways away, but. <laughs> <laughs> he wanted us to, to be a part of his virtual planking party. And um, so anyway, these comments from other people, you know, kind of coming into us about the YouTube community. I just wanted you to maybe have a chance to well, I'm, I'm, talk about the community that we have um, of boat builders I'm, and I'm real fans. I'm very fortunate to be part of that community. Um, uh, Steve and Alex over at Acorn Tarbella in particular are very good friends of mine, um, of ours, uh, of many people in the community. And um, yeah, definitely, I spend as much time with them as I can get away from here, you know. <laughs> um, yeah. So, and um, I've benefited enormously from their support on social media and Leo's as well. Um, getting shout outs from those guys helped me a lot. Um, and uh, I hope I hope to do the same for other people at some point. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, I also feel as though um, um, Nope, lost my thought. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Um, so uh, does anyone have any questions for Andrew that you want to ask live? We do have a couple of hellos. I'm going to, um, I'm going to, oops. Oh, my goodness. It says live chat. I don't want to do that. I have nope. no ability to. Nope, nope. <laughs> but anyway, if anybody has any comments, let us know. Um, if there's anything else in the shop that you'd like to see. Andrew, is there anything that you'd like to to walk us around to, to see? Anything that you can think of now that we've 
um, any new tools you have that you're really excited about or that have come in handy for, for decking? Oh, yeah. Um, hmm. I got myself one of these things, which I've done my best to bugger up, but, you know, it's still going. Um, it is a great tool. It is a Vulcan Grip panel carrier. Um, so the way this, the hinges and everything work on this is as soon as you get a panel, I think the maximum is three quarter rows of it maybe that it will grip, but you know, anything down from that. You get a panel in there and you start supporting the weight here and it grips it. And then you can carry, you can carry four by eight sheets around just like that. Um, which is really good. And then you can tie rope to it and hold them up <laughs> here, which is huge. Like, I was really thinking that in order to do this decking process, I was going to have to build build back staging that actually went outside the shed to build like a ramp that I could walk up, you know, with four by eight sheets or whatever. But um, this eliminated the need for all of that. So this more than paid for itself. Um, uh, yeah, it can be good for drywall, be good for, you know, whatever. 12 Chickens 3 Dogs wants to know, are there any tools you don't have that you currently wish you had? Mm, always. <laughs> 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 that's, a, that's a dangerous road to go down. Um, I'm pretty well set up though, I have to say. Um, What I what I don't have that like I really do wish that I had here was more like large machine space. Um, it's always really awkward getting things onto and cut through on my larger machines. My big bandsaw that's on loan from an old friend of mine is outside uh, because there's nowhere to put it in here. Um, you know I keep oiling it periodically so that it's okay with that hopefully, but. Um, uh, I do not have a good thickness planer, and that is uh, a constant, like, constant problem. But like, even if I had one, I wouldn't have somewhere to put it. Really, like, um, what I'd really like is uh, this thing that I've heard of. There were these um, sort of traveling shipwrights um, based in Maine years ago, who um, they got hired to work on a previous partial rebuild of the Sylvina Beale, or maybe it was just. Anyway, um, these guys showed up with, um, it was a pretty big, like, box trailer, um, hauled behind their truck, and with doors on the side, and they open up the doors, and inside is a ship saw and a thickness planer oriented so that you could run stock through the side of the trailer, like, you didn't even have to take the machines out, you just, like, you plug the trailer into something, so you can run these things and then just start running stuff through. I think that's brilliant because you could park it wherever was right for the stock. You could park park it right next to the stock, like and not to worry about. So you want the, the trailer full of tools? Is I what want you're a trailer saying. full of tools. Yeah, basically <laughs> that's the, that's the short answer. I should have just led to that. Really, I want my trailer full of tools. <laughs> Pete Grunvig says he's excited to come up and visit from Florida. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's Pete and I Courtney. Pete and Courtney of Accidental Sailor Girl. If you haven't checked out their videos, they're doing a lot of really cool, they're always doing really cool boat projects, woodworking projects. Pete just finished a mandolin. Um, they're fixing up a Pacific sea craft and they have a beautiful Danish lap straight boat that's up in Maine that's 40 feet long and and oh I don't know what is it 18 tons or something 16 tons <laughs> so anyway really great okay. channel um let's see and that's it for comments for right now um if uh the other thing I'd like to point out is um that you've had a couple of reviews recently in Wooden Boat Magazine. If people want to check out um, your perspective on tools, um, Andrew wrote an article on the Milwaukee Compact Router that's right that's there. sitting right right there. Yeah. Um, 
which has has played a role in in the decking process and in the the deck beams and everything so um having a cordless router was pretty key right andrew having as many cordless things as possible is key like the more you get into this the more like you end up tripping yourself up or getting your tool hung up or your tool unplugs halfway through like because it's got a little bit of tension on it or so any any way of going cordless is is great from that point of view but then ultimately when the boat's in the water and i don't have mains electric all the time um, it electrically speaking makes a lot more sense to charge batteries than to you know, run the inverter So you're getting set up for a future as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, Dave LaFontaine asks, why does your lovely assistant hide behind the camera? <laughs> I'll have to ask her that. <laughs> that is a good question for me. Um, I'm Anne. I, uh, I've been directing the videos and, and, um, and kind of choosing subject matter and things like that for Andrew. I don't know where to look, and that's why I'm not in front of the camera. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, um, but anyway, I... Uh, I'm also an editor, like I'm not just a video editor, I also was an editor at Wooden Boat for a time and um, and I'm also a producer podcast and these are things where um, my job is to let other people shine. So it's not about where I am, it's about the fact that Andrew's the center of the show. What's the plan for after... <laughs> What's the plan for after you splash? Um, probably, like, if I can find a situation that I can stay more or less in this area for probably another season, um, it's probably going to take another season of fit out um, rigging and systems and all that stuff once she's in the water. Um, but then after that, uh, I don't know, go cruising for a while. Um, Ultimately, I really want to put this boat to work in some way, whether that's moving cargo um, carbon neutral or being a mobile workshop, like I was talking about. I could, could do similar thing, sort of, with a boat, um, so with a big trailer full of tools. Um, <laughs> uh, but in some way, I want to put it to work, and for that, like a lot of those possibilities, I need licensing, which I don't currently have, so I'm going to have put in sea time oh no oh no, <laughs> no. question Except from most of my sea time is from too long ago right so. right <laughs> um amber and nina della de santo want to know good morning hi have you looked at the perkins how much confidence do you have that we can get it running um well I guess it's also an Anne question. It's also an Anne question. <laughs> Anne has actually been uh, taking point on the Perkins. Um, we also have had the advice of uh, Mike Franco, um, local fellow who's, um, yeah, we have mutual friends that uh, put us in touch with him. Um, very, very talented when it comes to diesel engines, and he feels good about it. Uh, Anne feels good about it. So I don't feel very confident about engines at this point. That needs to change, it just hasn't yet. Um, uh, but I, I trust them, so it all looks good, I think. And on, and so we are cleaning the Perkins right, we, I'm cleaning the Perkins right now, and uh, it will be done within the week, and then I think that we'll run a proper bench test, and maybe we'll do a process video on that, because I know that there are very few resources on bench testing sort of at the beginner level so uh, maybe that's something that we will look into doing and let's see next question Ben Seven says I can't hang around but I'm glad you're doing a live video hoping oh. you'll do it again thanks Ben Sevens who's a fan out west um, and uh, Pete Grunvig says, I also want to build a trailer like that one. Yeah. I've been designing one with a dust collector and side doors for shade and access. Yeah. And Amber and Nina wanted to say thanks for answering their question by saying she is a beautiful boat. Oh. She is a beautiful boat. 
can you she actually actually in the, here in this shot um, I wanted to address like what this long hatch is that we see in the shot there um, what's that all about so that is a uh, scuffle hatch um, uh, that is actually part of the foremost partner um, so the the aft piece of the foremost partner is removable which then allows you um, it's very much like a tabernacle, um, but it's a tabernacle with no moving parts. And uh, in some ways, it, it gives you more control because a lot of this far is still under deck, like it can't get away from you as far. So this originally was actually for lowering the foremast of the lugger at sea. They would lower the mast while they were hauling their nets um, and other things to uh, lower the center of gravity of the boat to like improve the motion. Um, so, which like, I don't know, I'm sure there are really heavily built tabernacles that would be fine with, but some of them it wouldn't be fine to do that while you're at sea, it's more of a, when you're not at sea kind of thing, but this, I think, would be fine. Um, uh, I'm doing it a little bit differently than it was traditionally done. Uh, traditionally, you would also have a three-sided mast case that comes down from the partner all the way oh, down. below decks. All the way down to the step. Um, that basically extended the partner between the deck and, and the step. Um, I have decided not to do that, partially due to material constraints. Um, they are very large pieces of, of wood that you need for that. Wide. Wide and long. Um, uh, I also just don't think it's totally necessary. I think, it, I think it's kind of a potentially a throwback to when this type of boat wasn't decked and that was like that was what you had for for a partner oh for structure um, for the right. partner um, okay. you had that and it was bolted to one of the thwarts they didn't even call them beams they called them thwarts it's still holding over from when there was no deck and people were actually sitting on things um, I also wanted to point out to people the anatomy of this boat, which I meant to have my coffee with me, which has a sticker on it, which if people want stickers, listen, we have a sticker design, but we just haven't put anything together. We want to know maybe if people want stickers. Now's a good time to tell us. Maybe we put together a little shop and start with stickers and go from there. Um, but anyway, her sail profile is on your logo, and there is a mizzen which will be step through this partner. And there's a four, which I remember when I worked on a story once for a wooden boat, there's no main. Neither, neither of them is called the main. There's a four and a mizzen. Which is um, a holdover from when, uh, traditionally most luggers were actually three masted, in which case the central mast was called the main. Um, that there was a mix of that kind of falling out of favor and, um, as I recall, some um, effort by the uh, customs and excise to, to actually regulate the building of three-masted luggers because they're faster, um, if they're handled properly anyway, they're faster. Um, so the fact that there's nothing referred to as a main on a two-masted lugger is, is a throwback to relatively recent past that was like the beginning of the 19th century that happened which in wooden boats is relatively recent past um, <laughs> yeah cool and uh another thing about That's my understanding anyway another thing about her setup and how she how she looks and everything is that her length on deck and her sparred length are very they're quite different um yeah which in boats in like in north america at least that's not that uncommon either but it will be a great long boom that will be you know you have a a bowsprit and then a great long boom this then has a bowsprit and um it carries a number of names but uh you could call it an outrigger or a boomkin or a bumpkin or i'm sure there are other names for it but um a very long spar that actually puts here somewhere i haven't quite figured that out and then runs out the stern as the um, the sheeting point for the mizzen because mizzen mast is right here. It's only like like six feet from the stern post, 
Um, and the large mizzen, at least, is, is really quite large. So that's, but the shooting point needs to be a bit. So that makes your length on deck about 40. Yeah, length on deck's just under 40, and um, I haven't 100% finalized what I'm doing for, for spars and sails, but it's probably going to be 80 to 85 feet um, canvas spars. So, yeah. uh, I don't know how to say this handle. It's. Oh, yes, I do. Intuitive, N to A T I V. <laughs> Is it though? Um, <laughs> two beautiful classics. Do you and Leo have plans to sail together someday? Uh, who knows? I mean, um, we used to be. We used to live in the same town actually years ago. Um, so I mean, I'm sure. I'm sure we're heading to the Carrot Roads at some point. <laughs> Can't imagine we won't. And we have lots of positive, Scott Wooster says, looks great, glad to see people like you preserving history. Oh, you. And um, Pete, of course, like telling us about transatlantic diesel for parts oh, yeah. and yeah, yeah. getting that, getting yeah, that Perkins get out business, there. Uh, yeah. um, also a little shout out that Andrew is looking for lead. I We're am. looking for lead in any form you have it. Ingots is like, is 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 luxurious but mm -hmm. um would take wheel weights sailboat keels whatever um yeah i've i've got quite a bit but i need quite a bit more <laughs> so. what do we got for external and internal ballast in this boat um so originally traditionally nothing external um i have after much back and forth and what have you um, decided to put a little bit external um, I was gonna put a pretty substantial worm shoe on the keel anyway um, and I figured I might as well do the middle section of that in, in lead so um, it's gonna be about 1500 pounds externally it's pretty minimal um, especially given that this boat takes around five five and a half tons um, which probably should include the engine and other heavy things, but um, still, it's like quite a lot. Uh, and the rest is all internal. Man. Well, great. I think, I think we've had fun. Are you having fun? <laughs> Gosh, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I did want to say this in the video that your you're not a, a television presenter, you're a boat builder. Yeah. And so to that end, yes, we're probably not gonna do process where every day we check in with people about what kind of progress you're getting, you're making, because that's not your, your, your goal here is to build boats, not to make videos, but can you Quite speak? Quite apart from anything else, editing out all the swearing would be a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> but um, what do you hope people people get out of the the sharing that you're willing to do? Because you're quite you're actually quite shy and reserved, and it takes a lot for us to to get these together because this isn't what you do. But like, so why do you do it? Why are you doing videos? Um, I want I want people to know about this boat and her history. Um, I feel pretty strongly about everything. To um, so, uh, bringing that to a wider audience is, is nice, um, bringing it to people that have been involved with and invested in this boat for many, many years is really nice. Um, uh, Richard Griffiths, the previous owner, um, knew an awful lot of people. He cut a very wide swath, so I've heard. I never met him, but, um, and so there's, there's people all over the place that, um, like to hear about how she's doing is really really nice um, um, and then like I said I, I really want to um, in any way I can kind of add to a, a longer term body of knowledge for people doing stuff like this um, whether it's the first time they're doing it or the hundredth time they're doing it like we through the 
process of doing these big and complicated things, we end up approaching problems and then figuring out ways to solve problems that most people never write down. And I think that's a shame. Like, um, I would love to leaf through a book that was all those things of like, well, I had to do this in this way with these constraints, and this is what I came up with. Like, um, I think that's great. And anything I can do in that way, I feel good about. I want to thank everybody for joining us today. And, um, and we've got a hello from Kitchener, Ontario. Beautiful place in the world. Um, Stanley Weath says, try your local tire shops for the wheel weights. You might be able to, to, set, to get some from them. Yeah. And, um, and so we've had everybody from Ontario, West Coast, Florida, all around tuning in today. And well, thank you so much. And uh, if you enjoyed this, um, please subscribe to the channel. And we want to thank everybody who's recently subscribed. We've had a yeah, bump in subscribers, you. and we've also had a bump in Patreon supporters. Yeah, thank you all so much. It, it really it makes a much larger difference than uh, than you might even imagine. <laughs> it really does. So thank you. Yeah. Oh, and another shout out from Memphis, Tennessee. So it's really great to see to see people tune into this. It 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 makes us want to do this more and um and to share more and we'll make time for you if if you're if you're here and so we'll just keep going then thank you so much for joining us today i don't even know how to stop it <laughs> no really oh boy, <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> there are all these buttons <laughs> we could just keep going all day until my battery runs out. <laughs> Honestly, though, thank you for joining us, and we really appreciate you.